I want to uh, talk about um, some work that I've been doing with uh, my collaborators, uh, my collaborators uh, In Sun Wang and William Lee over the years. I think we've been working on this project for roughly 12, 13 years. Um, the first talk that I gave on these topics was at IWOTA 2011, 10 years ago in Seville. And uh, today I'm going to talk about work that has been published in Advances in Mathematics uh, 2014, a memoirs of the American Mathematical Society in 2019, a recent paper in JFA, and a fourth time in preprint, which is almost finished. And I think by the end of next week, uh, we're going to be submitting it for publication. So it has to do with the berlin lax kalmus theorem for infinite multiplicity. And we're gonna start from the very beginning by saying that there are four questions. We identify four questions that emerge from that theorem. Uh, the theorem characterizes a shift in variance subspaces for vector valued Hardy spaces. So completely says that the backward shift in variance subspace is a model space uh, for some inner function uh, delta. So question one, we are interested in finding a sort of a minimality question. If I take a set, a set of vectors in H2E, this is the uh, vector value of Hardy space. And if I denote EF star as the smallest backward, inver backward, invariant, backward shift invariant subspace containing F, then we know that there exists a delta uh, realizing that as a model space. But what is the smallest number of vectors in satisfying this equation, or can we actually describe F in terms of uh, the equation? Uh, to examine this question, we consider operator value functions on the unit circle constructed by arranging the vectors of F as column vectors of some matrix. And as we pursue this question, we are naturally led to look at a new canonical decomposition of operator value, a strong L2 functions, strong in the sense of Vladimir Pella. So question two is that, is every strong L2 function of the form uh, phi equals delta A star for some inner function delta? And this factorization is not uh, casual, it's just coming from the Douglas Shapiro Shields factorization for matrix functions of the type. So the question is, can I take Douglas Shapiro Shields factorization and push it up to uh, operator valued Jeffries uh, operators? Question three, talks about uh, a shift in variance subspace being the kernel of a possibly unbounded Hankel operator. And uh, so here, motivated by this question, we uh, produce a new notion of Berlin degree, as we call it, for an inner function. And so the next question has to do with how is that Berlin degree for the inner function related to the spectral multiplicity of the restriction of the backward shift to the model space? And finally, I will say something about metamorphic continuations of bounded type or pseudo continuations for operator value functions and use this notion to study the spectral multiplicity of operator models. So here is an overview of, this, of the topics we're gonna cover. Uh, we're gonna first look at functions of bounded type, then Abraham's theorem, uh, the notion of stronger two functions, the canonical decomposition for those, metamorphic pseudo continuations, Berlin degree, and finally, how is the Berlin degree related to spectral multiplicity of the model operator? So uh, notation, unit circle, open unit disk, many of these things have been covered in previous talks uh, by uh, John, by Viktor Vinnikov and others, and of course in the special sessions too. Um, given a phi in L infinity, the Tempest operator is defined by multiplication and then projection onto H2. Uh, this, this will be the scalar case so far. And then the Hankel operator, which you multiply by phi, you project onto the orthogonal complement, and then you bring it back into H2 by this map J that simply uh, shifts and conjugates. Uh, T phi is analytic if the symbol is analytic. Bounded type if the symbol is a Nevalina uh, class function, quotient of two H infinity functions. So we have an L infinity symbol, which is a quotient of two H infinity symbols. And we come to Kalmus problem five, 1970. This is 10 problems in Hilbert space. Is every subnormal Tepris operator either normal or analytic? We know that uh, Carl Cohen, John Long proved this. Uh, the answer is negative, 1984. And they gave a concrete example based on some 
uh, by um, um, the special ellipse that you can build and then carry in a, a polymorphic transformation from the open unit disk into that ellipse and back. Um, Abraham C in 1976 had proved that if phi or phi conjugate is of bounded type, namely of the form above, uh, hypernormal and kernel of the self commutatory and for T phi means that T phi is normal or analytic. Now I remind you that uh, if uh, an operator is subnormal, therefore it's hypernormal, and also the kernel of T phi star T phi is the invariant for T phi. This property, the second property, is actually true for the so-called two hypernormal operators, which are much weaker class than the subnorms. So they, Abraham should prove that uh, Hellman's problem five it can be answered in the positive if um, uh, if you assume that the symbol is a bounded type. So the, the symbol that uh, Carl and John uh, had was not a, a, a bounded type. Okay. So now we come to the Berlin theorem that states that a non-trivial um, shift invariant uh, subspace has to be of this form, where theta is an inner function. And uh, if f is non-zero, and we form the smallest invariant subspace containing f, Berlin theorem implies that you can find an inner function with the property that f is equal to theta and g. And g had, can be chosen to be a cyclic vector for the shift. And so we end up with the inner outer factorization of F since outer functions are cyclic vectors of the, uh, the cyclic vectors of S. Now, Berlin also proved that a H2 function is outer even only if the log of G has this uh, um, averaging property over the unit circle. The log of G of zero is in absolute value is one over two pi and so forth. Okay, so it's kind of a neat characterization of outer. Now, given a bounded operator on a Hilbert space, we know that uh, an invariant subspace for T corresponds to a, a the, the orthogonal complement will be an invariant subspace for T star. And so associated with the inner function, which produces a shift invariant subspace, is the model space, the orthogonal complement in H2 of, of theta of H2, which therefore will be backward shift invariant. So this observation falls short of determining which f in H2 can be cyclic vectors. But for that, we need a deeper result due to uh, Ron Douglas, my advisor, uh, jo George Shapiro and Alan Shields. And that's, uh, that says that f is in H2 is non-cyclic for a star if and only if there exists a g and an inner function theta so that f can be factored in this form, z bar theta, the inner function, g conjugate, okay? G is in H2 um, almost everywhere on T. And it's equivalent to requiring that H has a meromorphic continuation to the exterior of the unit disk. Moreover, if, if we assume that theta and G are co-prime, we obtain a cert certificate of non-cyclicity. Namely, I can check whether something is non-cyclic by looking at uh, the um, orthogonal complement of all the translations by the backward shift and check that that's equal to theta H2. Now, co-prime means that uh, theta and G do not have any common non-trivial factors. Now we're gonna switch to block templates operators or matrix value. So everything gets tensor by Cn in the natural way. I'm not gonna bore you with the uh, details because all you have to do is just tensor with Cn. Okay, so there's your Hankel operator and J N is gonna be of the same, the same way, but now you have to insert an identity uh, matrix there. And in particular, if you care, if you wonder about what is this in concrete terms, take a function in H2 and then look at the power series expansion F0, Z F1, Z squared F2, Z cube F3 and so forth. And then what is H of Z bar cube of F? That's gonna be F2 plus F1Z plus Z squared F0. That's how the Hankel operator works, right? Uh, I took a, uh, you, you see that it grabs uh, these, these first coefficients and then just creates a new uh, function like that. Uh, T phi is a uh, matrix with operator entries and those operator entries are templates operators with symbols, the entries of phi. All of this is very straightforward. Hankel operator the same. Um, phi 
tilde is going to be the function that takes the, 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 the indeterminate, conjugates it, applies V, and then takes the, the star, the adjoint. Okay? Um, pretty much what you do when you prove the uh, Schwartz lemma in, in one complex variable. The matrix value function, um, uh, delta is called inner if you have the property that delta star delta is the identity almost everywhere on. Uh, on. Now, keep in mind that the matrices could be rectangular matrices, so you have to specify which identity you want here. If you have two uh, functions in L infinity, operator value, I'm sorry, matrix value functions, then there are some identities that are anticipated. Uh, the adjoint of T phi is T phi star. The adjoint of the Hankel operator is the Hankel operator associated with that symbol phi tilde that I defined in the previous slide. Uh, there is a certain property for the uh, commutators, you know, T phi and uh, T phi, the semi this is called semi commutator. And then, uh, some property of the Hankel operator when the uh, Teplitz operator has analytic symbol, uh, similarly in the other direction. And the one that we are interested, most interested in is this one here that says that if I take TZ and I hit it with H phi star, I get TC star H phi star. Now remember that phi is in uh, L infinity. So phi star is also in L infinity. So I may, I may as well have written H phi and H phi here and this simply means that the uh, kernel of H V star right here, or the kernel of H V is an invariant subspace for the sheep operator. So moral of the whole story here is that the kernel of a Hankel operator is invariant under the sheep operator, okay? And now finally, we're gonna say that a function is of bounded type um, uh, if it's, uh, each entry is of bounded type and rational if each entry is rational. I'm gonna give you an example um, at the very beginning to, to see that if you start with an inner function, uh, the adjoint of delta may not be of bounded type. So look at this H and the three is chosen for a reason as you will see in a minute. Uh, if you look at H Z uh, over radical two, uh, normal, normal infinity of H and this F H is in H infinity, H bar is not a bounded type as it can be easily proved. F uh, conjugate is not a bounded type. Uh, we now consider H1, which is given like this. And here is where the three comes into play with the two there and so on. Um, H1 is in L infinity. The absolute value of H1 is uh, bounded below by one over radical two. And uh, therefore there exists an outer function which has the same modules, right, almost everywhere on, on T. Now I'm gonna take that G, I'm gonna combine it with the F, F and G, I'm gonna form a two by one matrix uh, delta, and I claim that this is inner. Well, there's the calculation delta star delta, I selected my F and Gs and H1 in such a way that this would be one. And so, and then I'm going to, uh, one can see that delta star is not a bounded type by, by a simple argument. So the adjoint of an inner function may not be a bounded type, keep that in mind. Block tipless operators have been studied by, <laughs> this is a yeah, short list. I mean, the, all the names that I could remember, and, uh, but um, some of them are in the audience, some of them are attending IWOTA and so forth. And I, I started looking at this uh, from um, my advisor's uh, uh, textbook, Binary Cultural Techniques in the Theory of Tipless Operators, is in America from the, at one of these CBMS uh, lecture series that he gave. And uh, I got interested in, in some of the extensions, some of the extensions are straightforward to matrix, some of the extensions are quite hard. And of course, when you go into the infinite multiplicity case, which is what we're starting today, situation sometimes is highly non-trivial. Uh, the shift operator on H2CN, so we're still in the matrix case, is given like this. Sometimes people write an identity to so N down here just to emphasize that we are working on operator value symbols. And we have a Berlin Lax Halmos theorem there, okay? And it says what it's supposed to say that the, every invariant subspace of the form of theta H2CN, where theta now inner in the sense that we described before, theta star theta equal the identity. And as a consequence, 
if the kernel is non-zero, it's going to have to be of the form theta h to z, right? Um, so BLH was then extended uh, to infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space uh, value uh, symbols by uh, Paul Harmos, who incidentally came up with a very nice proof which is dilation theory, which is quite different from the proofs that we were used to seeing. Uh, Gu, Hendricks, and Rutherford in 2006, uh, this is Kaishin Gu, by the way, uh, for phi in L infinity, the following statements are equivalent. Phi is of bounded type. The kernel of HV is theta of H2CN for some square inner matrix function theta, or phi can be written as A theta star, where A and theta are right co-prime. What is right co-prime? Well, same definition, but since now we're working with matrices, we have to distinguish between left and right. So by right co-prime, we mean uh, that A and theta do not have a common non-trivial right uh, factor. I came into this uh, top topic because of Abraham's theorem, which I like very much, and we wanted to extend this to, uh, to the um, infinite multiplicity case. So is this true for matrix value symbols first? Well, um, let's look at the following symbol, Z plus Z conjugates, zero, zero, Z, okay? Very simple, okay? Uh, both P and phi star are a bounded type, okay? Uh, T phi is what it's supposed to be, Notice that I'm taking the adjoint there because TZ bar is TZ star. This is abnormal. Why? Because the first one one entry is self adjoint and the two two entry is subnormal, is the shift, right? Uh, but this is not normal or analytic as one can prove. So there is a problem there. We have a phi and phi star of bounded type satisfying the hypothesis in Abraham's theorem, and yet the uh, resulting Teplitz operator is not um, normal or analytic. In 2014, with the assistance of Dongo Kang, we proved that a matrix value version of Abraham's theorem in the rational symbol case is true. So later on, and we extended the result to the case of bounded type symbols and obtained a full-fledged uh, matrix value version of Abraham's theorem. So I'm going to show you what we did as a definition. We say that a symbol has a matrix singularity when this inclusion is true, right? For some non-constant inner function. That inclusion is, is not necessarily true, but it's a, it's a natural assumption if you want to prove something like an extension of Abraham's uh, theorem for matrix value symbols. So uh, phi, let phi be of the form phi and phi star on the type and assume that phi has a matrix singularity. So T phi is hypernormal. The kernel is uh, of the self commutator self is invariant the TP, and therefore TP is normal. In particular, is TP subnormal, then is normal or analytic. And that's what we proved. So we extended Abraham's theorem for the matrix uh, value symbol case. And as I say, one and two are true always for subnormal operators in general. They don't have to be techless or anything like that. All right, so let's revisit now. Um, Berlin, Lux, Halmos, uh, we're working in the infinite multiplicity case now. So D and E, separable complex Hilbert spaces. Uh, we're going to look at E valued, uh, L to space, Hardy space, operator value function, mapping Z to an operator from D to E. So just as in the case of matrices, we were allowing rectangular matrices. Now we are allowing bounded operators from one Hilbert space to another Hilbert space. Here comes a key notion from Vladimir Pellard. A strong L2 function is one that point by point, point wise, produces an element of L2E. Okay? So we have a function going from phi to the bounded operators, and that may or may not be a bounded operator, but it turns out that when you, um, I'm sorry, it may or may not be an element of L2, but it's L2 strong, L, strong L2, because you're going to take a vector x. And you're going to multiply by that. So this, this would be the value of phi at that vector x. And it's supposed to give you an L2e function for each x in D. Strong L2 functions have been considered by uh, Nikolsky and Peller. And in particular, Peller shows that this set is um, a nice collection of symbols of the so-called vectorial 
handkill operators. So it's a natural class if you study vectorial handkill operators, and we're going to use some of the things um, that um, uh, he he start stated in that in that paper. Now uh, we also have H two strong, which is the obvious definition, right? It has to be analytic symbols. Now. We uh, have gone uh, far further than Peller in the study of strongest functions because we needed to learn more about them in order to uh, study the questions that we wanted to study. So strongest function with values in B, D, E, then the kernel of H, phi, check or breb uh, star is uh, given by an inner function where these function is defined like this. This is a flip. So previously I defined the tilde where you take phi of z bar and then you conjugate. Now here we are simply taking phi of z conjugate. This is so-called so the flip. If you are inside the unit uh, disk, you will be outside uh, and then you will remain inside the unit disk in this one time, but in the, in the, op in the opposite uh, hyperplane. Um, um, a e prime is a subspace of E and delta is an inner function B prime. Okay, so keep in mind that the E prime may not necessarily be E; it could be a subspace of E. Now, this Hankel operator may be unbounded, but that's okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna deal with that. So we wanted to get the uh, uh, the delta the delta H two prime to be the kernel of a Hankel operator, but we have to sacrifice boundedness. So this operator could be unbounded. For an inner function delta, we're going to denote the orthogonal complement of delta h e prime in h to e by uh, h of a. This is the uh, so-called model space or the branch Robniak space mentioned in the first talk on Monday by Victor Vindikov, uh, Monday morning, Monday afternoon in, uh, in England. Uh, observation, if phi is an operator value L infinity function, then the kernel is uh, phi star uh, kernels with symbol phi star is shift invariant. And by VLH, uh, it must be of this form. Uh, now, delta is not necessarily a two sided inner function. In fact, if it is, then phi has to be factorable just like in Douglas Shapiro Shields. Okay, so um, uh, that factorization happens sometimes, but not all the time. And so we're going to try to find what other factorization, what is the analog of this? for the infinite multiplicity case. So that equation two characterizes a class of operator value functions whose uh, flips are of bounded uh, type, where uh, phi breb is given like this. So now here's what we can prove. Canonical decomposition of a strong L2 function, is a, the generalization of Douglas uh, Shapiro Shields to the infinite multiplicity case. So take a phi strong L2 function, uh, then phi is of the form delta A star, this is Douglas epilogy, plus a remainder, plus a B, where delta inner function, delta an A right coprime, delta star B equals zero. See, this is a key that this B is not just anything, but it has to be in the kernel of this star. So if I hit everything with delta, uh, if I if I were to uh, hit everything with delta star uh, on the left, this will disappear and I will have delta star delta a star, right? So uh, NC, this is the degree of non-cyclicity to be defined in a couple of slides uh, later. The degree of non-cyclicity of phi plus the analytic part of the symbol phi is less than or equal to the dimension of E prime, okay? Where phi plus embraces is the set of column vectors of the analytic part of phi and uh, uh, NC is a degree of non-cyclicity introduced by Basunia and Nikolsky. When the dimension of E prime is finite, then this equation is unique up to unitary equivalence. This equation in general is not unique, but if, if the E prime come in uh, from the inner function, it happens to be finite dimensional, then you, you do get uniqueness. Now take a subset F of uh, H to E and form as in question one, uh, E F star. So I'm going to take F, I'm going to move it with the powers of the adjoint of the shift, okay? 
and I'm going to form the close linear stand that's EF star. By Berlin Lux Calmos, it has to be H of delta. So in model space. Okay. In general, if the dimension is one, then every SC star in the space admits a cyclic vector. And therefore, M is EF star for some F in H2. However, if dimension is bigger than or equal to two, this is not the case. And I'm going to give you an example of this. So um, M is the H uh, delta with delta equals Z, zero, zero, Z. And M does not admit the cyclic vector. That's the example. Now take phi in uh, H2 strong. This is the um, uh, functions that point-wise are in H2. And look at an orthonorm orthonormal basis for D. D is a Hilbert space has an orthonormal basis. So look at phi k, which is phi times dk. Now phi is the matrix, and dk can be represented as a column vector. So you have here a vector in H2E. We then define uh, brace phi as given by uh, the phi k's uh, regarded as a, as a vector in H2E. So phi may be regarded as a set of column vectors phi k, in which case we may think of phi as an infinite matrix value function. Here is the, the, the diagram, right? So you will take phi one and write all the coordinates. These are all numbers now. And phi two, same coordinates, phi k is the same coordinates. So phi is now an infinite by infinite matrix, right? And so it's a matrix value function, infinite matrix value function. If in addition, we know that phi is of the form delta A star B as in the uh, decomposition theorem that I proved before uh, for theta for delta inner and B in the kernel of delta star, then delta star phi has to be A star. And therefore, uh, delta delta star phi plus B uh, is gonna be delta star, delta delta star phi plus B is gonna be phi. So you recover phi by doing this, keeping B in the kernel of, um, of delta star. Now I'm gonna take a strong H2 function and I'm gonna show that uh, we, we prove that E phi star is equal to the range of a certain Hankel operator closure. So this is a, a concrete realization of uh, E star F for some F. Right? I, I promise that one of the things that we were going to do in question one is try to ascertain what are the different possibilities that you have once you have a subset of uh, uh, in, uh, in H2, right, for, for E star F. So we recall that uh, phi is uh, of this form. And by definition, uh, brace phi depends on the orthonormal basis of D. Right? I choose an orthonormal basis to it. However, the previous lemma, this lemma up here, shows that this actually is irrespective of the orthonormal basis because it ends up being the closure of the range of Hankel operator all the time. So the definition of brace P um, is independent of the orthonormal basis. The degree of non cyclicity is defined in this way. It's kind of uh, sort of natural, but you, you look at G's in H2E minus EF star. Right, so I, I, I look at the orthogonal complement of this uh, uh, set in uh, H2E. I look at the uh, dimension of the space of um, is this, this, the uh, G evaluated at theta, right? And then I look at the supremum of those dimensions in when theta runs over all the uh, unit, open unit uh, disk. Uh, that is NCF. It could be infinite, right? We will often refer to this as the NC number of F. If the dimension of E is finite, the degree of cyclicity, which is denoted by DC, is the dimension of E minus the degree of non cyclicity. So both of them will then be um, integers and, and adding up to the dimension of E. So naturally, the degree of cyclicity and non cyclicity in the finite dimensional case will have to add up to the dimension of the space. In particular, if I know that EF, EF star is a H of delta for some delta, and this delta, which in principle is just an inner function, 
it's going to be a two-sided inner if and only if the NC F is equal to dimensionally. So we, we have a characterization of two-sided inner when in terms of the degree of non-cyclism. Uh, now recall the lemma uh, that if L is a strong L2 function, then delta of H E prime two is the kernel of some Kankel operator, which could be unbounded, right? We're gonna now look at a strong L2 function and uh, by berlin lax uh, Halmos theorem, we know that we can write, look at the analytic part of phi, form a brace, look at E star of that brace uh, is equal to H delta. And moreover, uh, um, kernel of H phi brev star is gonna be theta of uh, something, right? Because it's also invariant under the shift so some inner functions delta and theta with values in some spaces there. Each one has a prime, so the, the second one has a double prime. Now, delta, we wanna see how, how the delta from here and the theta from there compare, right? So delta is theta delta one for some two-sided inner function, delta one, right? And then uh, in particular, the kernel of this will be theta, what we have right there, if and only if the uh, degree of non-cyclicity is equal to dimension E prime. That's what we mentioned in the previous slide. So now, if delta is inner, and we write delta star and look at the kernel, this is delta star is also a matri a, a, an operator value uh, function, uh, maybe not inner, right? Um, I'm sorry, maybe not bounded type inner, but not maybe not bounded type. Then the kernel of that is gonna be omega h to d prime, okay? And we're gonna define the complementary uh, function of delta by looking at the left greatest common divisor, right? This is arithmetic in, uh, in h infinity, where you look at the inner functions associated with every g in this kernel. Look at the g, look at the inner outer factorization, Right, and look at keep the inner uh, piece, take the uh, left GCD and call it delta C. And so we have omega is delta C, and therefore the model space for delta C is the range of delta. Uh, the one by two matrix, I put the comma just to make sure that people don't think that we're multiplying, so, but it's really, this is really a matrix. Two, one by two matrix, delta delta C is inner function with values here. The kernel of the Hankel operator associated with H with del delta star is the range of this uh, um, uh, one by two matrix. And um, I'm gonna show you now what, what is exactly this uh, delta C. I have defined it there, but I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you why it's called complementary. Uh, what happens is that if you look at the one by two matrix del delta delta C and you multiply it by its adjoint on the right, delta star delta star C, you get the identity. I think it's, it's sort of clear from the identities before that we had, but this is delta delta star plus delta C delta star equals the identity. So this is kind of covering what is left after delta delta star, which we know may not be the whole, the whole thing, but you have the Delta C comes to the rescue in a certain sense. Uh, as a corollary, we have that for a strong L2 function, the following statements are equivalent. I take the analytic part and form the E star phi plus space, I get the whole H2, or the degree of non cyclicity is zero, or the kernel of the Hankel operator is zero. It's kind of a straightforward corollary, but it helps to visualize what are the extreme cases that we are considering. Now, delta and inner function, uh, delta C, the complementary factor, then the degree of non cyclicity is the dimension of D plus the dimension of D prime. Uh, if phi is uh, in um, L2 of MN plus M, so kind of going back to the matrix case as an application of the infinite uh, multiplicity case, phi of bounded type, 
the kernel of the Hankel operator is delta H2 for some two-sided in a matrix function, or the degree of non-cyclicity is N. So here is a, a can concrete characterization in terms of the degree of non-cyclicity of being bounded type. Whenever I have a matrix value uh, function, uh, uh, L2 function phi, and I want to say, is this bounded type? Well, compute the degree of non-cyclicity of the co-analytic part, the phi minus, and see if it's n. If it's n, if it's, if it's less than that, then it will not be on the type. But all else, check the kernel of the Hankel operator and see if this inner function, which always exists, happens to be two-sided inner function. OK, so phi uh, of bounded type, if and only if the kernel of h phi star is not 0. That's another characterization. Uh, if delta is m by r, uh, delta star is on the type, delta breadth is on the type, and delta delta c is a two-sided inner where delta c is a complementary factor. All of these things are equivalent. So if I want to check the delta star is on the type, I may as well check the delta breadth is on the type, or that the one by two matrix has a two-sided uh, inner, is, is, uh, is, is two-sided inner. So, I'm going to recall question one because now we have an answer for question one. So it was we were taking a set F of vectors in H2E. We were forming EF star, the smallest subspace of H2E uh, invariant under the action of the, uh, the uh, powers of the adjoint of the shift. Right? Um, then there exists a delta so that EF star can be realized as a model space. And the question was, what's the smallest number of vectors in F, or can you describe it? So here comes the theorem. We look at um, uh, uh, phi plus, the analytic part, form the brace, look at the set of column vectors. Then we, the following are equivalent. Phi breadth is a bounded type. Phi breadth, remember, phi of z bar is, is phi, phi breadth of z is phi of z bar. And then uh, this space is equal to H delta for some two-sided inner function. I should have uh, highlighted two-sided there. Uh, the brace is containing H to uh, theta, some other model space for some two-sided inner function. Um, and uh, for uh, phi one, phi k one, phi k two, phi, uh, we let C equal to uh, phi k1, phi k2 as yes, the matrix, and then this is uh, say that it's a bounded type. Okay, so this was condition four. Okay, all of those conditions were equivalent. You can, you can. The goal is to try to prove something about bounded type because phi, phi breadth is a bounded type if and only phi p is a bounded type. But at the same time, that condition characterizes the uh, the e uh, phi plus stars. Okay. So we know what the Hankel operator is, right? And the Teplis operator is generally a densely defined operator defined in this manner, right? And um, uh, uh, Pellars uh, proved that uh, H V can be extended to a bounded operator if and only if there exists a function C, so that the Fourier coefficients of C and the Fourier coefficients of P agree for negative N, right? And therefore, the, this, and the distance HP is uh, given as the distance of C to H infinity. And uh, question three said, is every shift invariant subspace the kernel of a positively unbounded operator? So we're going to use this result from Peller, and we're going to answer question three as follows. We take a delta is an inner function with values in B prime E. Then there exists a function phi uh, in strong H2 with either D equal E prime or D equal E prime plus one more dimension. So the co-dimension of um, E prime in D is either zero or one, uh, satisfying that the kernel of the uh, adjoint of the Hankel operator associ associated with the symbol phi prev is uh, delta of H E prime. So this is the answer to question, uh, question three. In general, if a strong L2 function is of bounded type, uh, one cannot guarantee that each entry is of bounded type. Uh, this happens, this is true uh, in the case of matrices, but now we're talking about uh, infinite multiplicity. 
Uh, now, we, however, if we strengthen the assumption, we have uh, the assertion. And for that, for this, we mean we're going to look at C, a function that goes from the exterior of the unit disk exterior. Um, and we define uh, C sub D by uh, this uh, C star of one over C conjugates. We take a, a point inside the disk. We take the conjugate. We take one over. And then we take C star of that. If CD is strong H2, inner and two-sided inner with values in uh, some bounded operators on two Hilbert spaces E and D, then we shall say that C is a strong H2 function, inner and two-sided in D E, the exterior of the unit disk, uh, respectively. So uh, this is a, a definition that allows us to go from inside the unit disk to outside the unit disk. So now we look at a C, which is valued in operators. Uh, and then we say that it's a meromorphic of bounded type in the exterior of E, if it can be represented as G over theta, where G is strong H2 in the exterior. And uh, theta is a scalar inner function in the, by scalar inner function, we mean that it's an inner function, but uh, the entries in the diagonal are scalar. So. A function phi is uh, said to have metamorphic pseudo continuation phi hat of bounded type in the exterior of the unit disk if phi hat is metamorphic of bounded type in the, and phi is also in the non tangential strong operator limit of phi hat in this sense that if you were to take uh, the traditional thing to take a z multiply by r, take the uh, phi hat and then let rz goes to z and acting point-wise on x, you recover pz of x. And so for almost all z, uh, you have that phi uh, of z um, is gonna be uh, the limit of the and equal to phi hat uh, sub d star of z x, okay? Now, uh, look at the stronger two function and uh, assume that it has a metamorphic pseudo continuation in the exterior of the unit disk, then we claim that phi brev is a bounded type. So this is a, again, a criterion for phi brev of bounded type, which is the same as phi of bounded type, which guarantees Abraham's uh, theorem in the infinite dimensional case. So phi in an infinity, the following are equivalent. Phi has a metamorphic pseudo continuation. Uh, theta of H2 is contained in the kernel, of H V star, so the, the inclusion is what we were after. And then phi is theta A star for some uh, scalar in a function and A in H infinity. Um, if phi is in L2, not in infinity, but in L2, uh, this lemma also holds, lemma 23 is this one here, with A uh, in H2 in place of A in H infinity. So if I want to take an L2 function here, I can do it, but then my A will be in H2. If D and E are separable complex Hilbert spaces and we take orthonormal basis, D, J, and E, I, and we form then uh, the inner products of phi brev with respect to those. So we form the matrix relative to those orthonormal bases. Then the following are equivalent. Metamorphic pseudo continuation to the exterior is the same as phi brev of bounded type. And it's the same as each phi brev of bounded type for each i. This is, this is uh, highly desirable because this is the analog of what we wanted to say that when you have a rational function, each entry in the matrix representation should be rational, which is not true in the case of uh, infinite multiplicity. But this says that under the ages of meromorphic pseudo continuation around the type, then you do get it. Okay, so time to look at the Berlin degree, which is gonna be connected with the spectral multiplicity of the, of the shift. So look at the, uh, look at an inner function delta, and we define the Berlin degree in a rather natural way. We're gonna look at the um, uh, dimension of D, which could be infinite, uh, so that there exists a pair AB, such that phi is delta A star plus B, is a canonical decomposition of, of phi. So going back to the generalization of the Douglas-Shapiro-Shields 
factorization, we now look at those fees that, uh, uh, that have the property of right being written as delta A star plus B, and then we focus on that pair, A, B, okay? And then that pair is associated with uh, D and E, but we then, since we're doing this, it's a strong L2 functions, we have to focus on the first space because that's when we evaluate for points, X, the X comes from here. So I'm looking at the dimension of that and go over all possible canonical decompositions like it. And then collect the dimensions of all those spaces D. And then I take the infimum. That's the Berlin degree of delta, the Berlin degree of delta, okay? All right, so given delta, I look at fees, the fees come with the D and an E, and with a pair A and B, I look at uh, the dimension of this D, take the infimum of all dimensions, and that's the Berlin degree. Spectral multiplicity, on the other hand, is a notion that has existed for, for us in the time of uh, Nash and Boyash, and of course, the, you know, Berlin like Sandos and so on. But it's the, the infimum of the dimension of F, where F is in E, and if we take the infimum over all generating subspaces, namely, Look at all the Fs so the T to the NF close linear manifold gives me back E. Okay. So I look at, I, I start with an E, I look at subsets F so that if I use that a set of vectors, I can recover E by taking uh, successive powers, all the powers. This is kind of the orbit, if you like, under the action of, of T. And uh, look at the infimum of all the dimensions, the, 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 the smallest dimension possible that it still recovers E, and that's the spectral multiplicity. So once again, Berlin degree is given in terms of the dimensions of all of these Ds, which allow for a uh, uh, decomposition delta A star plus B, right? And the second is just purely in terms of uh, E and the shift operator, okay? So this is spectral multiplicity. The two things, Berlin degree and spectral multiplicity, have something in common. So here we go. The Berlin degree and the spectral multiplicity, given an inner function with dimension of E prime less than infinity and let T be given by this, then the spectral multiplicity and the Berlin degree are one and the same, okay? This is one, one of the main theorems in the recent paper in JFA. Okay. We have completely uh, characterized the uh, spectral multiplicity in the dimension E prime uh, finite case where the degree of V delta is, um, is uh, uh, the Berlin degree is, is defined as above. Well. Yeah, okay. Corollary, if I take the backward shift restricted to the model space of delta, uh, and that's my T, and if I know that the rank of one minus t, 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 I'm sorry, t star t is, is finite, so this is uh, identity minus t star t, that has finite rank, then mu t is also the degree of uh, the Berlin degree of delta. That's a kind of, a, it's a sufficient condition to guarantee the quality here. As a remark, I would say that as a byproduct of the theorem, we can see that for an inner function with values in here, uh, if I look at the, restriction of the adjoint to the model space, then the varying degree is always majorized by the spectral multiplicity. And moreover, if I look at uh, this particular example, look at this delta, it's a four by three matrix. I put a couple of Zs in the diagonal and put it one, okay? This is built like this for a purpose. And then what I calculate is that the Berlin degree is equal to two, okay? Not, not too difficult to figure that out. So Berlin degree equal to two for that particular delta. Now I'm going to look at the spectral multiplicity. So T is given by this, we're working in, in C4, right? And so uh, H delta is HZ plus HZ. So a copy of the model space for Z is zero and then H2, okay? And then uh, you have HC, direct sum HC has no cyclic vector, right? So we must have the spectral multiplicity different from one because there's no cyclic vector, so they have to be 
no, cannot be one. In fact, if we put F and G like this, notice one zero zero A and zero one A zero zero, where A hat a, I'm sorry, A bar is not a bounded type, so some function not a bounded type, just to spoil the, the party, say, then uh, E, F, G, star, so it's a pair here, brace, star, is the, cannot, is the model space. That I think is pretty clear because of this representation here and what we have, the location of the ones, and that implies that the spectrum multiplicity has to be two. So we have illustrated the theorem in this particular case by saying that I calculated first the Berlin degree to be two, and now I calculated the spectral multiplicity two. Oh, coincidence, what's coming? This is illustrating uh, the theorem uh, that I, I showed before. Thank you very much.